Guys, please, as uh, I know you have been doing, we just encourage you to continue to pray for the situation in the Ukraine. You know, last um, Sunday, we shared a bit with you about Sana, our, our sweet sister here in the body who's from the Ukraine, and her sister and uh, her daughter um, wanted to give you a heads up. I won't get into the details of this because it, it, would, it would take the whole Sunday morning for me to share. Maybe at some point we'll share this testimony, but I just want you to know that, that they are safe. Uh, they are in, uh, in, not in the Ukraine anymore. They are safe. And uh, I, will, I will add this. They are in the home of a believer in Jesus Christ. They said, we're going to open our home. Tell me God's not working in all this. And I'll tell you, and, you know, for the millions of people that will be misplaced and displaced, I think God is moving. And we just need to remember that, um, remember Genesis 50, 20, you know, what you intended for evil, God will use for good. And so uh, we just, Father, now we're going to just continue to lift up the folks in the Ukraine. Lord, we pray for the, the hearts and the lives of those who are hiding and running and fleeing. We pray for the believers. We pray for the churches and the missionaries, God. We pray for the lives of those who thought everything was just fine a month ago. And they've been clinging to their own plans, and now reality's changed. And we ask, Lord, Holy Spirit, that you would meet them where they are in a miraculous kind of way. The Lord, for all of us who have said no to you for so long, Lord, that you still, uh, your kindness still leads us to repentance, Lord, and you reveal yourself to us in, in very dire circumstances. And we pray that you would do that for the people of the Ukraine, Lord. We pray for the leaders around the world. We pray for decisions that need to be made. We pray for our troops and the troops of those, uh, Lord, around the world. We pray continuously, as hard as it is maybe in our feeling zone, to pray that you would interact with the heart of Putin and just change him, Lord. And do a miracle in him, God, and his outlook, God. Uh, Father, just, you know, our hearts are just, I don't know, Lord, I feel like we're just living in a place of brokenness, Lord, and maybe, maybe that's not so bad. We want to be sensitive, and we want our heart to break over what your heart breaks for, as we'll see today. So, Lord, we just continue to lift up uh, Sana's family and her friends who are still in the Ukraine in streets and houses and hiding and running and are scared. And so many like them, Lord, and God, just Holy Spirit, do a work in this, Lord. We, we can't see it, but you can. And Lord, we trust in you. We don't trust in what we see. Uh, so God, we just pray that you would intervene and get the glory. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, we're going to pick it up for Samuel chapter uh, 15. If you need a Bible, raise your hand, and uh, we'll bring one by, by to you. Just uh, hand up high, and... Uh, if you've lost your Bible or you don't have a Bible or uh, you need an extra one for some reason, then uh, we encourage you to keep the one we're giving to you this morning. It's a gift from the Lord. Um, hey, real quick, and oh, by the way, I wanted to share this with you guys as our family. Um, just a, a little bit of information about Melanie and, and I. Um, uh, we are, uh, so I'll try to keep this super short too. Uh, for 27 years of marriage, actually a little bit longer than that, uh, our dream has always been to go to Israel. We've always wanted to go to Israel and, and really have never had an opportunity to, uh, to see that to fruition. Um, we didn't really say much to everybody, but a couple of years ago, back in 2020, we were actually able to get in on the roster to attend uh, a tour of Israel with uh, a pastor, Calvary Chapel pastor, Damian Kyle. Uh, he's in Calvary Chapel Modesto, and he's really served to be kind of a mentor from afar for me for a number of years. And when we found out he was doing a trip, we're like, I'm like, man, if we were ever to go to Israel with a pastor, it would be him. I would love to sit under his teaching, take the name pastor off of my name for a couple of weeks and just sit there. And so we signed up for that trip a couple of years ago. Of course, it got canceled and moved and postponed a number of times. And me, a little faith, said, well, it's probably not going to happen. My wife, on the other hand, uh, said, oh, it's going to happen. And she, she held out. So, uh, you know, just a, a couple of weeks ago, we, uh, we got word that the trip is actually on, that we are going to be able to go uh, with them to Israel. So our, our 27-year dream is coming true, uh, and uh, we, we are just excited about it. So we're going to leave tomorrow. No, I'm just kidding. Not tomorrow. Um, I'm not ready. I was telling somebody this morning, that still hasn't sunk into me that we're actually going. You know, it's two weeks away. We will leave on March the 15th. And uh, we'll be gone from you guys here uh, for two Sundays. We'll be back on the 30th of March. And, uh, and someone asked, are you, so are your kids going? And I'm like, <laughs> no. 
I mean, it would be cool if they could go, you know. And, uh, but, uh, so pray for us. Pray for the trip. Uh, maybe with technology in our favor, you might see us on a screen here. Maybe we'll work something out to do something like that. That would be fun. Uh, but just uh, pray that the Lord would, uh, if, if I could just ask, refresh us. And, uh, and meet us there, and um, yeah, that, w- that would be good, and, and again, you know, in the scheme of things, um, you know, uh, part of me feels weird telling you we're going to Israel when so much is happening in the world, but what a blessing this is going to be, and we just look forward to walking the, the footsteps of Jesus. I think it's going to do something for us, so keep us in prayer. We'll keep you guys uh, appraised on what's happening and show you some pictures and maybe maybe do a little thing from Israel for y'all uh, on the screen. So anyway, 1 Samuel 15. I'm not sure what page it's on. I didn't look this week. So 360 something, I think, for those of you who got a Bible. Uh, we're going we're gonna to attempt to finish chapter 15 today, but I just want you to know that there are a number of potentially heavy topics within um, you know, this chapter. I, I'm going to just tell you now, I'm not going to feel pressured to finish this chapter. If I get to the point where I feel like I'm rushing then I'm just going to stop, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll pick up next week. I uh, didn't want this to be a three-part chapter, but there's really a lot of little nuggets here that I don't want us to gloss over. And uh, uh, so in the um, uh, spirit of that, let me, let me just, I don't want to pray one more time. Father, thank you for your word. God, thank you for, uh, Lord, that you've preserved this word for us, God. And Lord, right now, as our hearts and our minds might be spinning like a top, your word is true. And it is the foundation of all that we are. And so, God, we, we just want to hear from you today, Lord. I pray you'd speak to our hearts, God. Lord, if you, if you step on our toes in any way today, God, it's, we, 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 we help us to be okay with that. Lord, we don't need to give you permission to do it. You're God. Uh, we just want to receive it the way you would want us to, God. So, so, Father, just bless this time. May we be encouraged. May we grow. May we be spurred on to greater things in you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So 1 Samuel 15, for those of you who are new, we do teach through the Bible typically here, and we've been going through the book of 1 Samuel for some time. Uh, Ask anybody if this Old Testament book has anything to do with our life today, and the overwhelming response to that is, oh my goodness, yeah, it sure does. There's so much here. Last time we were together, we walked through some very difficult verses. Um, where God commanded Saul and the, and the army of Israel to utterly destroy the Amalekites. And uh, this was not a storm or a tornado, uh, an act of God, as the insurance company calls it, right? This was someone being used as the instrument of judgment. And I can say it, Saul didn't do what God asked him to do. We learned that last week. Not that I would have signed up for that job. I wouldn't have wanted, I wouldn't have, wanted to, to have faced what Saul was facing. Nonetheless... As we look through those verses, the first nine verses or so of chapter 15, we were reminded last week that God's command to annihilate the Amalekites was not some arbitrary command. It was not, if you will, blatant genocide. Um, it was divine judgment. And God, remember, we saw where God made a way for the Kenites to escape. It was specifically the Amalekites. And we, I don't want to get into that again this week. We, we, we peeled the, back the onion, if you will, a little bit on that last week. But, but suffice it to say, God's command was not arbitrary. And then secondly, it didn't bring him any pleasure. Let's not, you know, God wasn't like getting revenge and like, I'm going to get you. You know, that, that wasn't his heart. It brings no joy to God to see those who are evil suffer, you know. It might to us, we might get a kick out of seeing evil people die, you know, kind of thing. But God doesn't get that kind of joy and excitement out of it. So this was not a vindictive move on God's part. He is holy, and that's not, that's not who God is. Thirdly, none of this was for personal gain for anybody. This wasn't wipe these people out and take all their goodies home and, 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 and you, know, uh, you know, stack your bank account in your coffers. It wasn't that at all. It was utter destruction. There was nothing to be left. So there was no gain. There was no gain for this for anybody. And then lastly, the bigger picture is, well, it's just that. It's the bigger picture. God is sovereign. He is the master over all things, and he can see everything. And that is not a cheesy, churchy answer. That is truth. God is beyond and above, and he created time. So he can see so much more than we can. And all we'll ever, ever do is hope to kind of understand that. I'll never understand being outside of time or space. I'll never get that. But God is, and he's sovereign, and he sees the entire picture. And in his grace, you know, we we didn't talk a lot, maybe uh, necessarily specifically about his grace last week. But once again, he gave these guys 400 years to change. That's God's grace, right? And we see that built into his, his, his timing. 
But God knew what would happen. He knew the people never would uh, change and, and repent. And he, he knew that if he allowed them to continue, uh, that would just fan the flames of debauchery and spiritual chaos and spin the world uh, out of control. This was a divine act of judgment. And it might be hard to swallow, uh, but that's uh, God sees the bigger picture. So Saul and his army, they set out to battle. But again, we saw that Saul was unwilling to do what God had commanded. And we saw that partial obedience is disobedience and delayed obedience is what a lesson for us God says do it we say why he goes it's already too late I said do it three seconds ago <laughs> kind of thing you know so so we don't want to live in disobedience we want to not be delaying we do not want to be partial about what we do when God commands us we want to do it right we want to do it wholly you know we love to say uh, and Sinatra used to sing about doing things his way right you know, and we like to do things our way. Uh, we love to be ingenious. We love to make changes. We love to tweak things here and there and make them our own flavor and our own style. Listen, the IRS, for example, doesn't say, well, do the best you can and don't worry about your taxes, do they? <laughs> doesn't quite work that way. There's a code. There's a way of doing things. It's called the right way. It's called the right way. Uh, God gives us no room to rewrite his commands. Now, this is all by way of introduction. But there are many people in churches today and perhaps some people here who would like to take God's word and what he's clear about and twist it and tweak it and change it to meet their desires. Guys, listen, that puts us in the foul zone. We can't do that. And so we need to take his word and we need to live by his word, not for what we want it to say, just like we don't get to create Jesus into the Jesus we want. He is who he is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we yield to him for who he is. So that's what we're going to pick up today. Samuel is going to approach Saul. So everything's gone down. Samuel comes to Saul, and uh, Samuel's going to be met by a man who's going to be full of excuses. Um, if you're never a person who points the finger and makes excuses, then perhaps this message isn't for you. <laughs> But don't be too quick to get up, because I think we're going to all find ourselves, just as we do every Sunday, right in the middle of this. Let's pick up with verse 10, 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 10. I'm only going to read this in sections, because if I get stuck and we go a third part, I don't want to get ahead of myself. Okay, so let's just read down through verse 16 together if we can. 1 Samuel 15, verse 10. Now the word of the Lord came to Samuel, saying, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king. For he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel. And he cried out to the Lord all night. So when Samuel rose early in the morning to meet Saul, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul went to Carmel, and indeed he set up a monument for himself. And he's gone on around, passed by, and gone down to Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Hey, blessed are you of the Lord. I've performed the commandment of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, Well, they, they've brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. And then Samuel said to Saul, Be quiet! And I, I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And Samuel said to him, speak on. So let's stop there. Guys, this is what's called getting caught. Okay, Saul's done got caught. <laughs> okay, and he's trying to squirm his way out of this. Don't raise your hand. Anybody gotten caught? Tried to squirm your way out of something, right? Saul took matters into his own hands. We've seen this. We saw it in chapter 13. When he offered the sacrifice the wrong way, I mean, he offered it. That was wrong. He shouldn't have done it. And then in chapter 14, we saw him take matters into his own hands when he uttered those two very rash vows that he made. Uh, and now we see it here again, him taking matters into his own hands when he makes the decision, when he draws the conclusion that his way is better than God's way. His way. Let's put ourselves in his shoes. My way of thinking and acting and living is better than what God tells me in the Bible. So I'm going to live the way I want to live, right? See, do you see the overlay there? 
Um, Proverbs tells us to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and to lean not on our own understanding. Saul is doing the exact opposite of that. Here, yet again, we see it for the third big time in a couple chapters where Saul is trusting in Saul with all his heart and not leaning on the Lord at all. So after all this goes down, God spoke to Samuel. It's interesting. God speaks to the person whose heart is tuned into him. Notice how he, when, when Samuel goes to Saul, God has already primed the pump. God has already revealed some truth to Samuel about what's happening. And I want to just draw a little bit of encouragement from that, uh, that God will speak to us. If our heart is tuned into him, he will go ahead of us and give us a warning or give us a heads up. You may not know what to do, what to say, but God's priming our heart. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Like, you know, you sense something. Like, God is moving. He's preparing us. And he was preparing Samuel. Samuel was the one God had, had raised up and sent. So God was speaking to him. So what does is, what is, what is Samuel say here? God says in verse 11, I regret that I made Saul king. Now, hold up for a second. When you read something like that in the Bible, I regret that speaks of oopsie, made a mistake, right? Okay? Okay, let me be clear. That is not what this is saying, okay? Because that would violate the character of God. He doesn't make mistakes. There's this fancy great big word called, and I'm going to try to get it right, anthropomorphism. Whew. I practiced that this morning. <laughs> anthropomorphism. What that is, is that's taking on the character of a human thought or action, okay, putting that character onto God to help us better understand. So he's taking on this, uh, this human behavior. He's not taking it on, but it's written in such a way that, that God, is, God is trying to help us get what it is that he's feeling. But it is not that God made a mistake. It is, it is not that what happened here caught God by surprise. Saul's misconduct did not surprise God. Um, God was not like, I should never have done this. Because if God says, I should never have done this, then God made a mistake. And if God made a mistake, this all changes. Who are we worshiping? Okay. So God didn't make a mistake. He's trying to get us to see here and understand it. Hosea chapter 13, I don't think I put this verse in your note sheet, but Hosea chapter 13, verse 11, um, it says this, I gave you a king in my anger and took him away in my wrath. Now, I, we don't have time to dig that too deeply, but again, God allows things. Did, did God see what would happen? Absolutely. He saw what was going to happen to Saul. He saw it before it ever started. He saw what Saul was not going to do. He saw Saul's sin, and inevitably all of this played into the plan that God had for, uh, for his people. So again, it might appear that God changes his mind, that God changes his plan. Uh, he does not. But, but, but so, so I regret. There's... A lot of Greek in the back of that word, but, but really he suffered grief. That's what was happening. God was letting us know that his heart was grieved at what was happening here. It's not that he made a mistake or that he didn't see it coming. It's that his heart was grieved, okay? I'm grieved at what Saul has done. Even though he knew it would come, he was still grieved. What, how does God see sin? I knew it was coming. No, it grieves him. It grieves him. If you could say this, and again, an anthropomorphic kind of way, it broke his heart. It broke his heart. Um, all sins break God's heart. Let's make a few points in our note sheet or app if you're following along. Point number one, okay? Uh, boy, I'm really feeling that this is going to be a three parter, but just saying. <laughs> The sin, number one, the sin of disobedience grieves God's heart. Come on, John, don't be so hard. I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not perfect. There are times when I'm disobedient. And God says, well, here, I'm going to give you a free get out of jail card because you're a pastor. No. When I am disobedient, it grieves the heart of God. 
And it's not for my good, and it's not for my family's good, and it's not for your good, and it's not for anyone's good. And when we are disobedient, it grieves God's heart. Guys, God is not emotionless. He's the power that up in the cosmos. No, he's not some power in the cosmos that's emotionless. Remember, we're created in God's image. Are you emotionless? No, because you're made in the image of God. We could get into that, peel that back. But, but God is not some emotionless being. One of the elements of being made in his image is that just as Jesus wept over Jerusalem, we weep. God weeps over what sin does, what lostness in the hearts of people does, what missing the glory of God, what missing Jesus, what missing truth and hope and life does. It brings grief. It brought grief to Jesus. It, it brings grief to God. God knew what Saul was completely missing. God knew what many of us today, many people in the world today are completely missing too, and that's this. Your sin leads to death. You know, the wages of sin is death, and and that's a verse that we hear frequently prior to coming to to the moment of salvation that's so very true, that our sin leads to death. But but allow me for a moment to speak to you this morning if you are a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, okay? You are born again, believer in Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit lives in your heart. Let me tell you that sin still leads to death. It does not lead to separation from God, but when we sin, something in our life dies. And we may not be able to put our finger on it. We might go, well, it's okay, and I'm just going to lift the carpet a little bit, and I'm just going to sweep it under there, and I'm just going to keep on going. Guys, listen, it doesn't work that way. Even for the believer, when we choose to disobey God and live in a situation that is not honoring unto him, it's going to bring a level of decay into our life. God's not going to say, oh, I see you, my child. That's okay. Your sin's not going to hurt you. No, it doesn't work that way. Now, God's grace is still real. We can't keep living in that situation because it will lead to a form of decay. What was Saul's sin here? Well, it was very clear. He had turned his back on following God, verse 11. So that's a heart position. He had turned his heart from God, not that his heart ever was really fully toward God. But God wants us to know that when we turn from the Lord and go in opposite direction, that is not the direction we want to go. Okay, and then he, had not, he did not perform God's commandments, verse 11. Now, specifically, his command was to utterly annihilate the Amalekites, and he hadn't done that. So Saul's heart was in the wrong place, and his hand was in the wrong place. He, if you will, who he was was messed up, and what he was doing was messed up. Guys, I'm, I'll tell you what. There are, oh, man. This can happen to us. We can be in the church and following Christ, so we say, and what we're doing is messed up. It can be. And we can think it's okay. And Saul, was he delusional or was he trying to be deceptive here? We'll get into it. This guy was messed up. I don't want, Lord, I don't want to be messed up like this. God, I don't want to turn my back on you and just go, yeah, big, no big deal. And, and I, don't, I, don't want to be, I don't want to be not being obedient to what it is that you've asked me to do and think, yeah, no big deal. It's no big deal. It is a big deal. Now look, it also didn't, it didn't just grieve God, but we see here that it grieved, it grieved Samuel. It says in verse 11 that Sam, it grieved Samuel. Some of your translations will say it angered him. It was, I guess you could say this was a righteous anger. Samuel wasn't like, oh man, I look bad. I'm the man who anointed him, and now look, he's gone down. You know, he, he's gone down, makes him look bad. No, that's not the kind of anger. Samuel was angered. Samuel was grieved at the sin, just like God was, right? And it says that he cried out to the Lord all night. Wow, man. That's serious. Have you guys ever been hurt because somebody's done something wrong and you literally cried all night long? So is that just a figure of speech or is the Holy Spirit letting us know that this really hurt Samuel? Samuel wasn't angry at Saul. He wasn't like, I'm going to take you out. He was grieved in his heart. Because that's what happens when people who are close to us or should be close to us do things like that. It hurts us, doesn't it? It really does. So, so we see this. We see Samuel was, was moved. And, and, and grieved. I think what we could say is what hurts the heart of God should hurt our heart as well. And guys, forgive us, Lord, forgive us if we ever look, and it can be so easy to get desensitized to so much in the world we live in, can it, can it not? But when we just kind of pass over things that absolutely grieve the heart of God and it does not move us, we need to check our hearts. 
God, I'm, I'm wrapped up into something that, that I probably shouldn't be so wrapped up in that I'm missing your heart here. What, are, what is really, Melanie and I were talking about this, what, is, what are these chapters here really all about? It's about the heart of God. Back in chapter 13, what did, what did God say? You know, Samuel or Saul, you're done. You're done. I've chosen a man after my heart. Man, Lord, may Thrive Christian Fellowship in each of us just be after your heart. Man, all the things we worry about sometimes just don't matter. As my dad used to say, they don't matter to a hill of beans. <laughs> what matters is I want to pursue the heart of God and all that I am and all that we do. And, and Saul, wasn't, Saul wasn't doing that. Samuel awakens early after probably what was a fitful night's sleep. God had called him on a tough mission. He had been called to go anoint Saul. Now he's being called to go rebuke Saul. And meanwhile, Saul's living like everything's just fine. Right? So Samuel gets word that, that, that Saul had set up this monument for himself. What did y'all think when you read that? So Samuel sets up a monument for himself. Isn't that, wow, that's kind of conceited, isn't it? Like, you know, he sets up a monument for him. A monument that Saul wanted the people to look at. And when they saw it, they would go, ooh. Saul the man. Yeah, look at that. Where is Saul here? I think Saul's embroiled in self-deception. I think he really is. I think he's his own worst enemy. Saul had so brazenly, blatantly, in your face, disobeyed God. Yet, he erects a monument in his honor. And what was he, what was he, what, what did he, what, what, what did the plaque read on the monument? This monument is to commemorate Saul's blatant disobedience. Of course not. You know, he's not like, hey, everybody, look at the monument. Remember how much of a loser I was. I didn't follow God. If it had said that, maybe it would have been an okay monument, right? Right? But no, you know, it was like, wow, you know, Saul, you're really so, you're really so good. You know, you've done so well. You've, you've gained victory in battle. You've brought so much. Guys, listen, pride blinds us to reality. It really does. And, and it pushes us, not only that, but it pushes us to crave the praise of man. It's not enough for me to be prideful in myself and think I'm all that and I'm going to build a monument in my name. But now I want people to walk past that and go, ooh, people aren't patting me on the back enough. I'm not getting what I, you know, people aren't praising me enough, right? Do you all ever say that at work? Do you, ever, do you ever say that in any context in your life, in your family, whatever the case might be? Point number two, now that I'm just casually taking my time knowing we definitely will be three weeks. Point number two, the sin of pride is always at odds with obedience to God. The sin of pride is always at odds with obedience to God. What do, what do we mean by that? If we are living in pride, we have walked away from being obedient to God. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. If it's all about me, and I'm living in the self-deception, and I'm trying to elevate myself and my standing, and it's about me, what I want, and who I am, I can't do that while at the same time holding on to being obedient to the Lord. It just doesn't work that way. Jesus taught his disciples that in the upper room. He goes, if you guys want to be all that, you got to be nothing. It's not about you. It's not about us, right? Jesus set that example as he took everything off, and he went to wash the disciples' feet. And they're like, oh. <gasps> You can't do that. And had I been Jesus, how many times did I say that? If I were God, and again, I'm glad I'm, we're all glad I'm not, you know. But if I had been Jesus, I would have stopped right in the middle and gone, well, y'all, what is y'all's problem? I don't see any of y'all doing it. Y'all high and mighty. The, the disciples are going, oh, I'm going to be the best, and I'm going to do this, and I'm going to start this church, and I'm going to be a missionary here, and I'm going to do that. And Jesus like, yo, you got, there's funk on your feet. You got animal dung between your toes and it stinks in here i'm trying to have a holy moment and it stinks in here and somebody's got to take care of the dirt that's okay i'll do it jesus steps up and he does it himself crazy it's all about me you know he wasn't singing his praises he was serving jesus is a serving savior you know well saul here was wanting to be served i think and and he had and he had this pride notice how saul greeted samuel in verse 13 god bless you you know it's like it's, it's almost like, hey, you know, God bless you, man. Look, hey, I've, I've done well. And he's like got this smile on his face. Like, you know, 
And, and, and so had, had Saul's pride seared his heart to recognize his wrong? Do you guys understand what I'm saying here? It was very clearly obvious that Saul had disobeyed God. Yet Saul is acting like everything's fine, okay? Um, or maybe this was a religious cover-up, you know, you know. Saul was deceived here a bit, you know. Um, in, a, in a way, it reminds me of, um, and I did this this morning. I can't remember who it was I did this to, and whoever it was, I didn't mean it the wrong way. Um, but you know, like, you, you get the greeting where it's like, hey, hey, good morning, how's it going? Good, man. I said that to somebody. Don't raise your hand if I said that to you this morning. And I, things are pretty good right now, but what I'm getting at is we can be so quick and go, oh, yeah, you know, we can just say something, but really that's not, there's more behind that. There's more there. And, and so here, here Saul is like, hey, God bless you, man. I, you know, I was obedient. Things are good. And, and, and Samuel is like, you know, dude, what's your issue? If, if you're good, if you were obedient and you were supposed to kill all the animals, then why do I hear these sheep and these oxen? Like, what is your deal? Can you not hear the obvious, you know, these animals that, dude, you're messed up. Like, that's just it. The, the vernacular is, dude, you're messed up. Like, you, you, you say you've been obedient. So Samuel calls him out. Um, you know, Numbers 32 says your sin will find you out. This was so painfully obvious, though. This wasn't like his sin finding him out. It was obvious. It was so in his face. So Saul is like a kid with his hand in the cookie jar and crumbs all over his beard saying, you know, oh, what? You know, I didn't do anything, you know. And then he plays by the sin playbook, the way he responds. We just get to see a little bit more of the heart of, of Saul in all of this. Right out of his mouth in verse 15, the first thing he says. So he's cornered. Samuel said, look, dude, you've messed up. I don't, you can, you're not winning any awards from, from me or from God. It's clear what you've done here. And we're going to get to the bottom of this. Well, the first thing that Saul says is, well, they brought them from the Amalekites. That's a good leader right there. Blame it on the people. Blame it on the people. Blame it on the men. He points finger. He places blame. Once again, he will not own his own sin. He will not look into the mirror. The people spared the best, he says. Oh, really? In verse 9, the Holy Spirit said Saul and the people spared the best. That's, you just left that part off, Saul. It wasn't just the people that did this, Saul. Leader, general, commander. Supposed to be the one in charge. You did this. Don't be pointing your finger at someone else. So point number three for us, okay? Point number three, pointing a finger and making excuses is not the way to respond to our sin. I've experienced this in my life when my wife gently and lovingly with prayer of forethought has been a generous wife and counseled me that I have messed up. Was that a nice way of saying it? <laughs> because I do mess up. What do you do, men, when your wife communicates to you and, and, and put, flip it around? Wives, when your husband communicates to you that maybe you've, you've done something that's not so good. The, the, the temptation that we all face is to go, well, you know, I mean, see right there? Well, I mean, yeah, but but you know, we want to blame. We want to, we want to shift it off of ourselves and maybe make her the one who, well, actually you, you know, or actually he, or whatever the case might be. You know, um, not a good thing to do. You know, we, so we see this in Scripture. We see it in Genesis, you know, and Adam and Eve. And, you know, well, you know, it was the, you know, God says to Adam, what's up? Adam's like, uh, sh she did it. <laughs> Eve, what's up? Um, yeah, I was talking to a snake, and uh, you were, what? But anyway, yeah, and he did it. And he's pointing fingers and p p blame and all that like that, okay? Well, verse 16, Sam Samuel's like, stop it. Be quiet. Stop it. Stop it. Saul, your words are empty. God's already spoken to me. God has told me specifically what happened. Well, all, all, all Saul at this point can say in verse 16 is, it's just so funny. He just says, all, all we read him say is, speak on. <laughs> like, what is he going to say? He's, 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 it's like he's shut up in his spot right there, you know? Um, you know? So let's, let's read on. Let's read on. Verse, uh, where do we leave off? 17. So Samuel said, 
When you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? And Samuel said, Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, king of Amalek. I have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. Hmm? I have. Really? But the people took of the plunder, sheep and oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gogol. So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he also has rejected you from being king. Now, at this point, if Saul's heart rate hasn't gone up, the dude must already be dead, okay? But yet we we, we see him and we hear him repeating the same thing. He's kind of got this one string guitar he's thrumming, you know, and it's just not working. It's not working at all. Samuel says, look, when you were little, and what he's doing is he's hearkening him back. Look, when you started out, Saul, remember in chapter 9 when we talked about the beginnings with Saul? How did he start out? Remember how he was hiding among the baggage? And in chapter 9, he said, am I not the smallest of the tribes of Israel? You know, my family, the least of the tribe of Benjamin. So he started out humbly. It's a good start. It's a good start. Okay. Even though we knew it wasn't God's best and his, his desire per se, uh, he started out uh, humbly. But what happened to Saul? The same thing that happens to God's people. The same thing that happens to people. People. Humble start. He got some military victories under his belt, which actually weren't his military victories. It's what God had done, but he took credit for him and then erected monuments for himself and all that. But he had some victories under his belt, and it went to his head. And once again, here he is. I'm the man, okay? Remember back in Deuteronomy, we, we, we talked about this and we flew the 30,000 foot overview. God warned his people. He warned them in a number of places. In chapter 8, though, this is a standard warning from God that was true from Deuteronomy to 2022 in King George, Virginia. This is a very true statement in chapter 8, verse 17. Beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this well. I did it. I did it. Guys, we live in a world where we're, we, our kids, you can do anything. You do it. You own your future. You can do it. I want to add that God can do anything, but I can't. I, I don't always win, do I? You know, I don't always get a trophy. I don't, you know, my car is slower than, I remember when my kids did pine car. Y'all remember pine car derby? The pine car races, I'd love to do one of those. That would be fun to do that here. I remember my kid, when he won first place, one of them won't. I won't name his name, but it begins with a J. Uh, It doesn't really help you. But I remember when he got first place, and he was like, oh, yeah, you know, he was so excited. And my dad built this car, and we built it together. And I I had no clue what I was doing. I just, you know, I don't know. You know, in the previous year, he didn't win first. And somebody beat him out, you know. And and sorry, you don't get the trophy. You didn't go as fast. That's just the way it is, right? But my goodness. um, See, when you get caught on on a rabbit trail of talking about pine car derby, you lose your place and where you're at in the sermon. And um, it happens to me all the time. Um, So I pause for effect. Actually, no, I pause and pray. Lord, help me. Where was I? You know, I didn't, you know, my power, my might, I've done this. No, we don't do anything. God does it, okay? And Samuel, Samuel asked, why? Why have you done this, Saul? Isn't that a great question? Have you ever been asked by someone? Has somebody ever come to you and said, why are you doing this? When it's something you know you shouldn't be doing. Praise God for people who will step up into our face and ask us, why are you doing this? We need those kind of people in our lives. Mark my words. The day is going to come when somebody's going to come to you and ask you why, and you're going to get mad at them. 
You're going to want to say, put your face a little closer to my fist. Dare you ask me why. But guys, Samuel was like, why have you done this? Guys, we need people like that in our lives. And that's why the end of this chapter is so heartbreaking. But we won't get to that this week. Why did you not obey the voice of the Lord? And then Saul says, I have obeyed. But in the next breath, he says, I brought back Agag. It's like, <laughs> then you haven't obeyed. <laughs> you want to grab the dude and go, you're not listening. What do you mean you have obeyed? Of course you haven't. Of course you haven't obeyed. I'm going to stop here today. Let me stop with this, though. Um, you guys okay if we stop here today? Have you ever talked to somebody, and this reminds me of this when I was reading this this week, and, and um, so as we follow Christ, it's our heart's desire in, in, the, in the body and the family to encourage other people to walk with the Lord, right? We want to do that. We want to be vocal. We want to be visible. We want to be encouraging. We don't want to shy away from the truth. Sometimes we have to say hard things. Uh, sometimes we have to let our foibles be known so others can realize we are human too, okay? Um, but have you ever heard a line like this? Someone says, you know what? You know, I just have such a peace from the Lord right now. You ever heard that? You ever experienced that? You just have a peace from the Lord? Now that's a good thing if you're living in obedience. But if you're not living in obedience, so, so what am I getting at? I've talked to folks who have been, and this is kind of reminding me of this here with Saul. Samuel's talking to Saul, and Saul's like, hey, brother, God bless you. Good morning, man. I'm good. I've been obedient. Things are good. It's almost like Saul's saying, man, I'm good. I got a peace. Things are great. Samuel's like, dude, if you've got a peace right now with God, let me step back because this is not good, okay? Now, now what, what I'm trying to get at is this in our, in our spheres of influence in our lives, whether it's a family member or someone, it might, it might be you know, someone in your community or s someone in the row next to you or someone in your Thrive group or whatever, your workplace, you name it. As a, as a, as a follower of Christ, if I'm, if I'm walking with the Lord and this person is telling me they're walking with the Lord and they're doing something in their life that is not right, but they say they have a peace about it. What are we supposed to do? I just heard that person say they have a peace from God while I'm thinking, but you're living in sin. What am I supposed to do about that? What did Samuel do? We'll see next week. But Samuel's like, oh, well. Well, I mean, you said you were obedient, and I guess we'll just overlook this and move on. No, he's not going to overlook it. God's not going to overlook it. Don't forget, guys, Samuel, loved, Samuel doesn't hate Saul. He doesn't want to see Saul go down. He cried all night over him. You know what I mean? Amen, man. I love it. I love it. I love, I, I love it. Ezra, just keep preaching it, brother. Yes. I really do like it. <laughs> Emma's probably like, no, I love it. <laughs> you know? And he had just cried all night for, for Saul. Samuel is not going to let this go without addressing it. So, um, so we'll end there. We'll end there for this morning. And uh, lot, lots more to cover as we, we'll wrap this chapter up. But I want to leave us on that note, on that, on that verse. And we're going we're gonna to dissect these two verses more next week because I think they're of great importance. Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. If you guys are doing 10 things for Thrive Christian Fellowship and your walk with Jesus is not good and you're living in disobedience, that is what matters most. Please don't let churchiness and religion and activity blind us to what really matters. We'll talk about the Old Testament sacrifices next week, and God did initiate it, and the fat of rams was pretty good in the nostrils of God, but what God is saying is put it away. If you can't be obedient to me first, I'm not interested in those things. 
so much there for us, I pray. Let's all stand together. Father, we thank you this morning for what you have instructed us through Samuel and Saul. God, some of this is, woo, it's, it's heavy, but Lord, we, we, some of it's so good, Lord. We need people in our life like this. God, forgive us of our pride. Forgive us for wanting to erect monuments for ourselves and to elevate ourselves, Lord, and to create this, this self-deceptive reality that all is good when, Lord, very clearly, according to your word, it might not be. If any of us is in a place this morning where we're living in disobedience to you, Holy Spirit, pre- please, you bring the conviction, Lord. Uh, God, if there are those in our lives, like, like, you know, Samuel looked at Saul and it grieved him, if there are those in our lives where our heart is grieving for them, Lord, that you would give us the words and the heart with which to respond to them, God. Uh, we see very clearly, Lord, that, that you've called us like Samuel, you've called us to, to speak forth your truth, and, and to, but to do it with, with a compassionate heart. Lord, we, we just look forward to finishing this chapter. God, I pray you just continue to do a work in each of us, Lord. Uh, Lord, if there's one here this morning, God, that just, uh, Lord, your Holy Spirit has been provoking them this week, and, and, and Lord, uh, to just surrender their life to you, God. They, they're living, uh, like they, they've, they, they're tired of the monuments to themselves they've erected. They've, they're tired of, of, it's about me and my way, and they're tired of trying to live life in their own strength and power, and they just continue to crumble and continue to crumble and fall. And, and Lord, they've recognized, not, not, not by any sermon or anything, but they've recognized by your spirit that they need salvation in Jesus, Lord, that they would welcome you to change their heart and life forever today, Lord. They would cry out that just to confess of, of their sin and just to repent of that and to, to, Lord, allow you to recreate them, Lord, to give them a new heart, a new life, Lord. Uh, and Father, we just we, we thank you for the power that is at work uh, in us, Lord, through your Holy Spirit and through your word. Continue to do a work in us, Lord, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Listen, if you need, if you have, look, look if you've, if, if you confess and agree that you want Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and you want to surrender your life to him, I really don't want you to leave today without seeing me or Kevin or, or David or somebody tell us. You can let us know on your Connect card. We'll follow up with you because there's a next step for you to take and we want to help you do that. If you need prayer, we'll be available for prayer. Feel free to roam around the room. If there's somebody here in your Thrive group that you'd like to pray with now as we respond to the Lord in song, do that. Uh, just let the Lord speak to your heart and lead you as you worship him, as you pray. Whatever God has for this moment you know let him he's in control he's he's sovereign he's in control so give that to him god bless you guys and uh, uh, uh go in his strength amen